ababyeyi banjye nyine ntibemera ko njya ku ishuri bahitamo ko nzajya ndera abana nkashaka nibyo n'imirimo yo mu rugo nkakora n'imirimo yo mu rugo nyine mba numva binteye ipfumwe numva binteye kibazo wenda niyo naba mbagiyemo nkaba ntatinyuka kugira ikintu mvuga ko navuga ngo ndakivuga nabi banseke banegure bangaye cyaro no yemo mfite amahirwe yo kubanze gusoma no kwandika twaza tukabafasha ariko utazi gusoma no kwandika nabo bamwiyambaza birahari cyane bikomeye kuko nk'abantu bize baturusha amahirwe menshi hashobora kuboneka icyo kiraka bakagikora bagajya gukora ibizame bagatsinda bakabona ko kazi Sawa no barimo bahepfo hani ngwa cyangwa naba no mu isomero bakama igisha abana bangite Kandi na papa yo gusoma aramfasha iya mama abayagiye yaramfashaga wenda ari ari isomo baduhaye umukoro akunda genda ka Nine Dorokas tuzavane yahuye nabyo nibyo ngibyo byo kuba ngiye ntarabashe kumenya gusoma no kwandika Yari nibi kubera Tadi ini nara natara menya gusoma narasibiye kubera na mama tara bizinga jamfara Kona menye uburyo ngomba gufasha abana uburyo bwo kujya mu isomero bagatangira bakiri batoya Nawe mpashije kajya banyigisha inyajwi n'ingomba bi bakanyigisha kubifataga bakamani bakabaha n'ibitabo byo gusoma aba abana baragira Anche mi sono tutto giunto, ho tutto il canale di Gimba. Ho detto che non ho Narazibo nye na chane, kukua hali nga wana waba gabari kwa nunga na imutia dasho woye neza Hali kwa hama so merajiri yeho, ugo na kwa hali chino nga na wimofasho mugu wa mchiru huko wa wako meza wako yibuta, ujo vizi Non è che si tratta di un'altra cosa, si tratta di un'altra cosa, si tratta Ana wala wanza wakwa ni yungwa mawurijiyo Urumu kwa na ana wangwa ni chini ya wazi kutu ni yungwa mawana mure fumwe Ana kukuri chile wiza kuhu Ni wenda ni mba ntu mchene ntu ntu mugwere na rakuze Eh, ni mba ni ishi mye chane ni mba za umu nuko meye Bese mba ezo haza haza hi haza 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 is a network of volunteer advocates all across the United States 
working with their members of Congress to tackle the root causes and the consequences of poverty. And that includes our focus today, which is the right to education. You know, we're here today to focus on global literacy as a right of every child and to see how we can collectively tackle the barriers faced by far too many children, and especially the most marginalized and impoverished kids. And also the role the U.S. government is playing and can play in supporting countries to effectively respond. You know, the basics, I know you all know this, but to say the basics of learning to read and write and do math are the foundation for all of a child's future learning, but it is so much more. You know, it's about supporting young girls to have agency and to stand up for themselves. It's about increasing their confidence and opportunity to make their own choices. It's about young people being able to thrive in a globalized economy. It's about breaking intergenerational poverty. And it's about giving our children the chance to build the future that they deserve. So I'd like to start just with a big thanks um, to the Global Campaign for Education and to all at U.S. and to all of our event sponsors. So in alphabetical order, the Basic Education Coalition, Building Tomorrow, Child Fund, Humanity and Inclusion U.S., International Rescue Committee, Jesuit Refugee Services USA, Kenya Education Fund, Nauru Results, The Borgen Project, Together for Girls, UNICEF USA, World Learning, World Vision, and the Youth Alliance Working Group of the Children's Policy and Funding Initiative. And at the top of our agenda today, and one of the most powerful ways that Congress can make a difference on global education and literacy right now, is reauthorizing the READ Act. That bill was first passed in 2017, and it set up a powerful, coordinated strategy for U.S. education investments, better supporting countries around the world, and also boosting the role of Congress in oversight. And it's, as you may know, it's up for reauthorization now. We're going to hear more on that in a minute, but I wanted to start with a special thank you to the bill's lead sponsors, Senators Dick Durbin and Marco Rubio. <laughs> Also, to Senator Durbin's staff for securing this room today and helping this event happen, as well as all the work to move the bill forward. And also, a thank you to Representatives Chris Smith and Grace May, who are the House co sponsors of that bill. And I also want to say a big thank you to the original Read Act sponsors in the House, who are both now retired from Congress but still active supporters on this issue. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman. Um, Ed Royce and former Appropriations Chairwoman Nita Lowy, and we're going to hear from them in a moment. So, I'm so it's great to see you. Um, I'd like to just start by welcoming you, and I want to say just say a few words, uh, Chairman Royce. You know, as a long-serving member of Congress from California, Mr. Royce was chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee for six years and a champion of these issues for decades. And he and his staff shepherded a number of key pieces of global anti-poverty legislation through Congress and helped lead a bipartisan coalition to also stave off successfully cuts to critical global programs during the last administration. He was an early uh, supporter of the Read Act of 2017, and he was instrumental in its passage. He spoke passionately about the global needs of access to quality of education, especially for girls. And I would say, like, that work hasn't ended, you know, even uh, this summer. Mr. Royce and his former colleague, Nina Lowy, authored an op-ed in The Hill about why it is so important to reauthorize the Read Act this year. So please, uh, if you could come up, we're really thrilled to have you today. Thanks for Thank your you time. Thank you for I want to thank Dr. Joanne Carter. I want to thank Results, but all the other organizations that are here today, uh, you have a pretty important responsibility because, frankly, we don't have enough co-authors yet on this bill. And uh, I, I talked last night to our, our current chairman, Mike McCall, on the reauthorization. He is supporting. Let's, uh, let's spend a little time today getting, uh, especially on the House side, getting those co-authorships. And let me, let me say also that I very much appreciate your focus on this. And if I could convey to you, it's kind of a tragic story, but if I could convey to you some of the importance of this particular issue of teaching children to read, but most importantly, what it means to girls to read. Because I know for Nita Lowy, Eliana ross Leitonen, there are more, and she did. Eliana, how are you? Uh, I, the story I'm gonna tell is from like 20 years ago, but it was, it was after 9-11, 
and we had a chance. We we flew in to Kabul, Afghanistan, and there was a little orphanage there. And uh, our community, our Afghan American community, had supported this orphanage. They wanted me, and you know, the city was liberated to go and find this orphanage and, and talk to the people there, which I did. And one of the classes they were learning English, and I, I remember asking the boys what they were going to do. You know, on this side of the room, I just said, well, "What are you going to do when you, when you graduate?" I'm going to be a farmer. And then one of the girls stood up on the other side of the room, and she said, I'm going to be a physician. And she was a little girl. I said, why are you going to be a doctor? She says, I'm learning to read, and I'm going to learn to be a doctor to help my people. Now, for that child, unfortunately, that dream was cut short. But the tragedy there is simply to make a reminder that all over this world there are children, and there are girls especially, who are not going to have the opportunity unless we make it part of foreign policy and unless we have the leadership. One of the reasons I appreciate the invitation uh, by Porter Delaney to be a senior advisor for the Kyle House Group, is, well, one, I get to work with Amy Porter, my former chief of staff and reporter, but also, more importantly to me, is the question of reaching these senators and House members and getting them to understand the difference that U.S. policy, when it's officially part of policy and when our resources are going into focusing on leveraging each of those governments that we can leverage, there's one we can't, but many we can, to do the right thing and elevate, especially for girls, this opportunity to read. Because ultimately, we're going to, if we're going to lift people out of poverty, if we're going to give them a sense of opportunity, a sense of social upward mobility, this literacy is the foundation of all of that. And I, I uh, also uh, just know that these things don't happen by themselves. And I thank Lois Frankel, who was you know, my partner in a lot of this. We used to dedicate like every third hearing to women's empowerment in the committee. I think that was my idea, but it might have been even worse. <laughs> and um, it became a, a way to move legislation like this. Uh, we need to continue to keep a focus on. You're the ones, results are the ones who keep making those results. So thank you all very much. And let's go do what we need to do. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Chairman Royce, for your um, powerful words, especially about the right of girls um, to access to education and literacy, and also just your continued dedication on these issues and continuing to like move this forward as a piece of life's work. So thank you. Um, I also do want I did want to shout out and uh, give a special thanks also to Ileana Ross Leighton, who's with thank us today. <laughs> A champion on these issues um, when she was in Congress and continues so in the work that she's doing now as well. So thank you. Um, so today you're going to hear from uh, global education experts and champions about the progress the U.S. is supporting countries to make toward providing quality, inclusive education, literacy, and education for all children, and also how that work underpins everything else we're supporting countries to do, whether it's health, nutrition, economic sufficiency, greater equality, ending conflicts, women and girls' rights and empowerment. And I just, you know, building on what Chair Moore said, I cannot stress enough the importance of continuing this work without any lapse in programs or funding or timing. And to do that, we all have one job, which is to pass the READ Act, Reauthorization Act. And as you're going to hear this morning, I hope it'll be clear, this critical piece of legislation is truly a no-brainer. It will allow coordinated, integrated strategy on basic education to continue. It allows us to focus on the most vulnerable kids, including girls and children in conflict settings. And it's going to preserve key measures of congressional oversight and accountability and transparency that can help deliver all of this. And you know, if you're here as part of civil society, I really urge you to join us in working to pass this bill. And also for those of you who are here and are working on the Hill, first, um, we know how much you make possible in the world, and we thank you for all that you do. 
And we really urge you to get your boss on the bill and to encourage them to push for the bill to be marked up in the House and passed in both chambers, um, ideally before the end of the month, but certainly as fast as we can make that happen. And so now we're going to hear a couple of videos from a few other leaders behind this legislation. So um, next we're going to have a video from uh, former chairwoman Neil Lowy, who couldn't join us in person, but was eager to share a video message from her home in New York. Um, and for those that, of you that don't know, thanks again, Chairman Morris. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know, you know, former chairwoman uh, Lowy was Capitol Hill's biggest champion for global education during her tenure, especially as chair of the um, SFOPS uh, subcommittee. She wrote the very first version of the READ Act. Some of you may remember that back in with the Education for All Act back in 2005 and saw that through to passage in, in 2017. And she also fought for strong funding for USAID's education programs and the role of partnership for education. So let's go to that video. Thank you to the entire international education community for urging Congress to reauthorize the Reed Act. As I look back on my 32 years in Congress, I am so proud of the accomplishments I was able to achieve with you on the Appropriations Committee. During my 20 years as either chair or ranking member of the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee, we increased funding for international basic education from 10 million to 950 million, an almost tenfold increase. But it is not just the funding, not just the number that is so critical. I also fought hard to make education one of our top development priorities, despite many efforts to cut it, to keep cutting it, and we stopped that. And critical to this work is the READ Act, which I was so proud to champion and get signed into law in 2017. With your help, I'm confident we can convince Congress to reauthorize the READ Act this year. After all, it is because of the tremendous education advocacy community that we have gotten this far. Your energy, your passion, remind us that prioritizing girls' and boys' education is the best investment we can make around the world. You are all unsung heroes, making an impact on the lives of the millions, both now and for years into the future. Thank you for your ongoing support of the READ Act. And again, so great that these folks um, are not only former champions, but continuing to be champions in this work. Um, uh, the bipartisan Read Act reauthorization was again introduced in the Senate this year, again by Senators Durbin and Rubio, and both long-standing champions of global education and leaders on this bill for many years. And I'm delighted that we're going to get to hear a short video from Senator Rubio, who couldn't be with us today in person, but really wanted to show his support. And I promised that I would say our, our Florida Results volunteers wanted me to particularly thank Senator Rubio and his staff for championing access to education and literacy year after year with his key roles on both foreign relations and appropriations. So, open the video. Good morning. I'm Senator Marco Rubio, and I want to thank you all for coming here today. We are blessed to live in a country that values the opportunity to obtain a quality education. It's part of what makes America great, the idea that success can be obtained by anyone, not just a privileged few. But America is also great because we're willing to work with governments less privileged than our own to ensure their people's access to a basic education. This reduces those governments' vulnerability to poverty, human rights abuses, and extremism. That's why I sponsored the READ Act in 2017 and why I've been working with Senator Durbin to build bipartisan momentum to reauthorize it. Together, we can help children across the world discover the joy of learning. Let's keep up the good work, and thank you for your support.
Um, so thank you to Senator Rubio and his staff, and also I want to again thank Senator Durbin and his staff, both for the work to like continue to drive this um, legislation in a bipartisan way and, and bring it to passage, and also just for the help in setting up this event today, so I'm really grateful. Um, so one more video before we turn to our keynote speaker. We're going to hear from uh, great Representative Grace Ming, Ming, who's one of the lead sponsors of the READ Act in the House this Congress, and who has been such a leader on foundational learning and the right to education for every child. Um, she led a new bipartisan resolution this spring, championing, the, again, the issue in her role on the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee, supporting the Global Partnership for Education, as well as USAID and more. And when um, Nita Lowy was retiring, as you know, as really as a champion, Ms. Mang said she wanted to make sure the U.S. legacy on global education remained strong and enduring and really wanted to help step in and, and lead that work. So we're really grateful to her and her staff for fighting for funding and pushing for the U.S. to continue to lead in this arena. So much for her leader. Hi, I'm Congresswoman Grace Meng. Thank you to the Basic Education Coalition for inviting me to speak today and to the many other groups present this morning who are champions of basic education and the right to learn. It's my honor to be with you to mark World Literacy Day and sound the alarm about the importance of reauthorizing the READ Act. Education is one of the most important foundations of child development. It is the cornerstone of free and stable societies, building peace, security, and prosperity for all. Following in the footsteps of the incredible former House Appropriations Chairwoman, Nita Lowy, I've been working to ensure that all children, regardless of their nationality or economic status, have access to educational opportunities. I helped introduce the READ Act Reauthorization Act to ensure that the progress we've made in both access and quality of education continues. It is events like today that will help highlight the importance of access to basic education and hopefully inspire quick action to ensure USAID's basic education programs continue. I look forward to continuing to work with all of you in support of increasing access to education. Thanks again for the important work you all do and to the Basic Education Coalition for organizing today's event. Thank you so much to Congresswoman for really stepping in very um, intentionally um, to take on a leadership role on these issues. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Leanna Mara the Deputy Assistant Administrator and Acting Senior Coordinator of U.S. International Basic Education Assistance. And that was a position created and authorized by the READ Act in 2017. She leads oversight and coordination of all resources and activities related to international basic education, including implementation of U.S. government strategy for international basic education across agencies and departments. She also serves as a U.S. government representative on the board of the Global Partnership for Education, and the Executive Committee of Education we Cannot Wait. And she also spent many years as a USAID Foreign Service Officer really using her expertise in education in crisis and conflict settings. And we're grateful that she is such a champion for global education and especially for the literacy skills that are the powerful foundation of every child's education. So welcome, Anna, and we're so glad to have you. Please step up. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today with so many champions of education, and especially those of you up here on the Hill um, working to make sure that the U.S. government is continuing to be the global leader that it is in international basic education. Um, the READ Act, I think it's just so important, and I have to say I've been with the federal government for 22 years, with USAID for 20 years, and I think it's one of the most critical pieces of legislation and one of the most useful pieces of legislation um, that I've worked on during my career. The READ Act codified the U.S. government's role as a global leader in international basic education and has really resulted in greater coordination and collaboration, and I can't emphasize that strongly enough. I think that we really now take a whole of government approach. Um, we are trying to co-locate programs, for example, with the Department of Agriculture and the Governor Dole. We try to make sure that they are located where we have literacy programs in countries. Um, we just see the strengthening across the board with the State Department. We share the 
board seat on the executive committee of education cannot wait. Um, so there are multiple ways that this has really helped to strengthen coordination within the US government and makes us stronger going forward. I'd also really like to take the chance to um, thank the global education, the global campaign for education, the basic education coalition, results, world vision, world learning, and the other hosts for organizing this event to commemorate International Literacy Day. Um, and really, I know the members of, of many of um, these uh, coalitions are our implementing partners, uh, and you really do the work. It's where the rubber hits the ground, um, and together we're learning, we're improving, and so I just really appreciate those partnerships. Um, USA really does value the partnerships and we're looking forward to building on our shared legacy of foundational skills work in the coming years. The primary goal of the US government strategy on international basic education, which was authorized by the Reed Act of 2017, is to achieve a world where education systems and partner countries enable all individuals to acquire the education and skills needed to be productive members of society. So it really is the foundation of all development work that we do around the world. This is a multifaceted challenge and one that we cannot accomplish alone. It begins with strong partnerships across the 10 agencies that support the READ Act and with the many people in this room today. We know that students experienced setbacks when schools were closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, both here in the US and in countries where we work. It's making our work to improve the quality of education all the more necessary. When the pandemic struck, it hit at the core objectives of the U.S. strategy on international basic education, which was to improve learning outcomes and to reach the most marginalized. So with the learning loss that we saw and with the number of students who perhaps didn't return to school, those two core objectives were the hardest hit by the pandemic. The U.S. government was able to utilize both the coordination structures strengthened by the U.S. government strategy on international basic education and the flexibility under the READ Act to quickly adopt and respond to the impact of COVID-19. Some have asked if the READ Act and the U.S. government strategy are still relevant given that they were developed in a very different global context. My answer is not only yes, it's even more relevant today than it was in 2017 given where we are post-pandemic. As we look forward, our partnerships are more important than ever. This includes our strong partnership with the McGovern Dole Food Program at USDA, which focus, uh, focuses on providing nutritious meals to students so that they can come to school ready to learn. The Department of Labor works to ensure that children are able to attend school and not enforce labor or victims of trafficking. We also partner closely with the State Department to ensure that children and youth who are forced to flee their homes are able to return quickly to safe learning environments. We know that if students are even out for short periods of time, six weeks, they're unlikely to return to school, so this response in humanitarian settings is crucial. The Millennium Challenge Corporation utilizes education programs as a key component to strengthen human capital, reducing poverty and economic growth. And in many countries where we have USAID and MCC co-located, you see USAID really working on that primary level, MCC on the secondary, and it allows us really to cover a full spectrum of programs. And I'm sure many of you all in the room today are familiar with the Peace Corps' critical work in partnering with communities. I'm willing to bet that we have a few return volunteers here in the room with us this morning. It is also critical that we partner and leverage resources with our global partners to raise awareness and action on the global learning crisis and the critical need to recover learning loss. USAID has co-formed and has joined with the World Bank, UNICEF, the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and UNESCO to create the Coalition on Foundational Learning. Together, we are working to garner political will and additional resources to tackle learning poverty. And the learning poverty indicator is the percentage of 10 year olds in a country that cannot read a simple passage. That 10, that age of 10 is important because that's sixth grade. So it's children completing the primary cycle without learning to read. We launched a commitment to action. And I have to say the US government was the first to sign on to that commitment to action to increase attention. <laughs> to increase attention and funding for foundational learning as well as publish jointly a report highlighting the increase in learning poverty since the pandemic. To date, 29 countries and 34 organizations have endorsed the commitment to action on foundational learning. 
joining the U.S. government's efforts to ensure all children are learning and gaining the skills they need to build more hopeful and prosperous futures for themselves, their families, communities, and countries. And I have to say one of the most exciting things that we've seen is that in many of our partner countries, we've got ministers of education stepping up to read regionally on this commitment to action, joining forces. Uh, we had one minister in Latin America convene 17 other ministers, nine ministers came together in Sub-Saharan Africa to really talk about how they need to right size their budgets so that there's an appropriate amount spent on foundational learning as well as across the spectrum. USAID is a global leader in international education and has spent more than two decades generating evidence and honoring our efforts to better understand that what works in education. Through partnerships with country governments, we help strengthen education systems so that US government investments have a ripple effect, not just for one student, school, or teacher, but for sustained, lasting change. Recently, we commissioned a 10-year retrospective study of USAID's investment in early grade reading from 2011 to 2021. We learned that USAID's programs have become more effective over time while simultaneously reducing the costs of our intervention. So those second and third generation reading programs really are becoming more efficient and more effective. For example, USAID partnered with the government of Rwanda to invest in improving the quality of education for children and youth for more than a dozen years. And we all know education impacts take a long time to change. Um, USAID directly reached nearly all early grade primary students and trained two out of three teachers from 2011 to 2022. USAID also provided training for at least one to two school leaders per school and distributed 14.8 million teaching and learning materials. According to final reports, USAID's investment contributed to a 17% increase in primary school completion, a 13% decrease in the percentage of students who are non-readers, and an increase in students who can read with comprehension. What we've also learned is that sustained commitment is key to improving learning outcomes. This longer term commitment in Rwanda and other countries where the, where the USG has worked was essential in order to learn, adjust, and build on effective interventions to achieve results at scale. Working with partner countries to strengthen education systems takes time, commitment, and resources. I'm proud to say that in FY 2022, the US government collectively reached more than 32.7 million learners. This includes early grade reading programs that advance policy reform, evidence-based teaching practices, revisions of curricula, development, printing and distribution of learning materials, and the generation of actionable data to monitor and improve system performance. Looking forward, we are eager to work with Congress and civil society to chart the course for the next five years and build on what we've already accomplished together. One core focus area we will be prioritizing is inclusivity so that all learners are able to access and benefit from quality education. Of the 240 million children with disabilities in the world, about half are out of school, and only 1% of books in low resource countries are published in accessible formats, like large print, audio, braille, or storybooks with sign language videos. This means that even the small number of students with disabilities who do attend school often don't have a single book they can access. USAID is committed to ensuring quality education is accessible to all and has pledged to align all new education programs with the principles of the universal design for learning and to reach 15 million girls with our programs by 2025. We will also continue to build on promising approaches and support educators to utilize evidence-based teaching practices from pre-primary education through the early grades into the transition to upper primary, secondary, and tertiary levels. Thank you all for inviting me today. I'll conclude my remarks with one key message. Education is foundational to success across all of our development goals. To do so, there must be accessible pathways for all people to gain the skills they need to succeed in life. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Carol Jenkins, and I'm the CEO of World Learning, which is a global nonprofit organization founded in 1932 with a mission to help children, educators, others to engage and to strengthen their communities around the world. 
It's an honor to follow you today. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you to everything that USAID has done for this community and for the world. It's been a leader in changing the lives of so many. Just by way of reminder to share a few statistics, according to the most recent READ Act report, the United States reached more than 32.7 million learners in FY22 through our pre-primary, primary, secondary, vocational, and workforce development programs in 97 countries. And I think we should be proud of that. We need to do more, it's not enough, but congratulations for the great work um, and just really the commitment of USAID and those on the Hill to support this piece of legislation. Like other organizations, World Learning partners with USAID in many different countries, and our programs are designed and tailored in collaboration with local partners in the countries we work, and they're contextualized to the needs. And this is what makes our work sustainable by helping students, teachers, administrators, governments, and communities implement lasting change across their educational systems. Since we're here for the READ Act, I want to make sure that we bring this down. We've heard from others this morning, the faces of the children. And just to be reminded how important and critical that is to remember, even as we're talking about important pieces of legislation here in this amazing building. Um, and I want to focus on one program that World Learning implements with several partners that are here even today, and that's in Lebanon. Um, funded again by USAID, and it's called Kitabi. And Kitabi means book, but in English it stands for Quality Instruction Toward Access and Basic Education Improvement. And as many of you know, Lebanon has experienced a lot of turmoil in the past few years and for many, many years in the past. And they are also housing more than 1.5 million refugees the largest number of refu refugees per capita in the world. And I've had the opportunity to visit that country several times over the years and was there late last year. And just to see the students, the, the children that are Lebanese children, but also the Syrian kids in those classrooms and how important the Qatabi program and the ability to access books and learning and educational materials is to them. And it's an amazing program that, need, that should be replicated in other countries around the world where it's appropriate because it's, it's reaching kids at scale and it's helping system, make systemic change in these countries. And with that, let me just share a few final words that I was thinking about when I was there seeing those children in Lebanon and those, their faces and the sheer delight of doing something on their own, of choosing their own book. The face of the reader when they've had the epiphany that those letters, those syllables, those concepts come together and they form a new word and they're like, ah, I've got it. Do you remember that time? The first book that you learned to read? One after another. It's one amazing puzzle and it never ends throughout the life of anyone, or at least it shouldn't. But it first has to begin and that's what we're here doing. We're trying to make this possible for everyone. Reading is the window to so many worlds. Knowledge, learning, creativity, music, arts, cooking, recipes, humor, leadership, plain old fun and joy, and of course, economic advancement, and dare I say, prosperity and hope. And ultimately, world learning has believed for more than 90 years that reading is a pathway to peace and advancing shared, shared values. Our founder believed that if someone had a meal with someone, we would not be able to fight with each other. We wouldn't be able to exhibit anger and violence. And I believe that if we read a book together, we will begin to build that common ground. One word, one paragraph, one chapter at a time. I hope and I know you will all join me in that vision. Now it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to the moderator for today's panel discussion, Ngozi Lawal, Principal at Early Actions. Thank you. All right, good morning, Carol. Thank you so much for the very warm introduction. Um, we are really lucky to hear from a variety of panelists, all in the global education space who are experts in their own right. Um, I'm really excited to be moderating this panel with three wonderful experts. 
Um, and I'm going to invite them all up, and then I'll introduce them um, individually. So I'd like to call up Dr. Allison Bryant, um, also Laura Denham, and Maha Shoy. If you could sit on this side, that way the camera can see your face. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Allison Bryan. Um, she is the Chief of Research Data and Impact at Sesame Workshop. Um, for background, Sesame Workshop is an independent, nonprofit organization with a mission to help kids everywhere grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. For 50 years, Sesame Workshop has focused on preschool aged children because research, research shows that they have the greatest potential to learn. Next is Laura Denham, a leading human rights and education advocate. In her current role as a government relations advisor at the Malala Fund, she works with governments and civil societies to advance policies, initiatives, and financing frameworks that allow every girl to claim her right to education. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Maha Shoei, a Fulbright Scholar from Pakistan and a former teacher who was recognized by the Teacher Task Force of the UN Transforming Education Summit in 2022. She is a current fellow with the Global Campaign for Education US and is an International Education Policy Master's student at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, we are going to begin our panel with short, engaging video from the Sesame Workshop that highlights an impactful collaboration between Sesame Workshop, International Rescue Committee, and NYU Global Ties for Children. Ahlan Simsim, which means welcome sesame in Arabic, offers a warm and joyful welcome to early learning to young children across the Middle East, especially those affected by displacement. So we're going to go ahead and start the video. To, yes, you can applaud. <laughs> um, I am personally a fan of all of the Sesame Workshop products. I still have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old in my home, and so it's a generational thing, so it, it just makes me smile. Um, I'll start with Dr. Bryant. Um, I'd like to ask if you can just share with um, the folks today why do you think it's so important to support uh, literacy in the early years, particularly, and how is Sesame Workshop working with partners around the world to meet the needs of our youngest children? Yes, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here this morning representing Sesame Workshop. So as mentioned before, we are a global educational nonprofit that is dedicated to helping children around the world grow smarter, stronger, and kinder to empower the next generations to create a better world. Now, I'm sure many of you grew up on Sesame Street, or you have children, I have a five and an eight-year-old as well, uh, who grew up on Sesame Street. I'm sure most of you have a favorite Muppet. Mine is Grover. It probably tells you something about my personality. Um, but what most people don't know is that we're a lot more than that show. Right now, Sesame Workshop is the largest informal educator of young children around the world. 
We reach tens of millions of children and families in 150 countries, on screens, in classrooms, in communities, in a lot of the hardest to reach contexts, particularly those where children are facing crisis and conflict. So I'm really excited to be here, not about that, I'm excited to be here um, and focused on the need for funding for early childhood education. So we know that there is a 13% return on investment for quality education for young children in educational, health, and economic outcomes for society. 13% return on investment, which is great. Um, that is also a catalyst for helping young children on a path to success and also to help children who are facing adversity. It provides protective factors, this early literacy and early learning. But, and this is referenced earlier, you know, here in the US between COVID gaps that we're facing and for children in crisis and conflict settings who are displaced and who are lacking formal education and lacking that sort of continuity of education, we are facing greater crises than we were when the Need Act was originally established. So I want to talk a little bit about the example that you heard um, or you saw the video about Ahlan Simpson, which as mentioned was a partnership between International Rescue Committee and Sesame Workshop. Here we were really focused on the Syrian refugee crisis in the Middle East and how could we provide them literacy, numeracy, and those emotional ABCs in a situation that was fraught with conflict and crisis. At the same time, COVID happened. So I'm gonna give you an example of how we were able to sort of pivot and innovate really quickly and move away from a traditional educational setting because the plan was we were gonna be addressing things in classrooms, right? We we're gonna be working with IRC and partnerships. We couldn't do that. So we quickly pivoted to a low tech solution. We leverage WhatsApp, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, um, to take our content and those teacher resources that should have been in the classroom and brought them into Lebanese Syrian refugee families. And in 11 weeks of this program, a virtual learning program, children were able to have gains equal to a year of in-person preschool on literacy, numeracy, and social emotional skills. Let's let that like sink in, right? 11 weeks of a virtual program leveraging media and teacher resources was a year of in-person preschool. So those kids that would have been left far behind actually leaped forward. So imagine the possibilities in scaling program like that or the other programs that we're hearing about this morning in providing continuity of education for these children, letting them not just fall behind, but helping them leap forward, helping them to create the foundations where they will, because we know they're gonna be dealing with these problems and these crises in the future as well. So that's just one example of the kinds of programming that we've been doing with our partners, with USAID. Over the past several years, we've been reaching children in Bangladesh, Iraq, Rwanda, Colombia, uh, and here in the US, as well. And in fact, this week alone, we were with the USAID um, team in Bangladesh with our partners, uh, with our group in Sesame Workshop for Bangladesh, celebrating World Literacy Day and talking about the incredible work that we were doing collectively to address literacy and numeracy, not just for the children across Bangladesh, but also very specifically for those children who are in the Rohingya refugee encampments in Cox's Bazaar, where we have a really strong presidents with IRC, with Brock, and with other really critical partners. So we know that we have programs that can work. You know that there are programs that can work. We are seeing the research and the evidence that we can implement programs that are scalable, that are adaptable. And we know that the problem is not going away. You saw in the video, there are more people displaced than since World War II, and half of those are children. So we need to be getting to those children. We need to be getting to them young, right? When we know that those neural connections are being made, when literacy and numeracy are the foundation for lifelong learning and economic success, even. So we know it works. We are going to double down assessment workshop on those efforts. We are gonna be looking at how we continue to adapt and change, but we need partnership 
We need support. We need funding. So let me leave you in closing with sort of one thought. Every dollar spent in pre-primary education results in $9 of benefit to society. So in my mind, that makes the READ Act and others like it the most important, the greatest investment that we can make for our collective future. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Bryan. You gave us a lot to think about and you've made such compelling reasons as to why to support the READ Act. And, and I really want, to, as an early childhood person, Thank you for lifting up the importance of the neural connections and the brain development that's occurring at such a young age and how it's important to be supporting literacy at such a young um, age. Um, and then also thank you for your comments around the specific needs of children who are displaced. Um, really, really important. Um, I want to turn my next question to Ms. Denham. Um, so as remarked earlier, there's a particular need for supporting girls um, with literacy and education. So I want to ask you, can you just speak to some of the additional barriers that girls face with numeracy and literacy and the work that you've been doing with Malala Fund to help overcome some of those barriers? Maybe this one will work. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, firstly, I want to say a big thank you to the event co-sponsors for hosting us today. Um, many organizations, as you heard, have come together in support of this event. Um, and I think that really speaks to the value that the global education community here puts on the READ Act and its reauthorization. Um, there's also nothing more enjoyable to me than being in a room full of people passionate about education, so I'm thrilled to have been invited today. Um, to your question, it's a really good one. Um, what I would lead with, or at least preface with, is that the data available on learning outcomes remains very hard to come by, um, to say the least, which makes it difficult to fully understand the gendered patterns um, of, of how children are acquiring foundational skills like literacy and numeracy. Based on what we are aware of, girls are actually outperforming boys on reading by age 10 in most countries where data is available. The opposite is true for mathematics currently. But regardless of that kind of relative comparison, um, it's worth acknowledging that learning outcomes across the board in low and middle income countries um, are generally not good and there are still very large proportions of boys and girls living in learning poverty. Um, reflecting a little bit more specifically on the situation for girls, I think there are two key um, kind of overarching barriers or challenges um, that need more focus in order for all girls to have the best chance at developing foundational skills. The first is, do girls have the opportunity to access education in the first place? Um, if a girl doesn't have the opportunity to access education, she's self-evidently much less likely to develop literacy and numeracy skills. We've seen amazing progress in expanding access to education for all, but there are still deep regional gender disparities that exist. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, progress on gender parity in access has been stagnant over the last 10 years. Um, in Afghanistan, of course, um, we obviously continue to see the devastating rollback on girls' right to access education at secondary level. Um, in low-income countries overall, girls remain far more likely than boys to never start school or to be withdrawn from school when they aren't learning. Um, in each context, the, the specific barriers to access that girls might face will differ. Many of you will be aware of some of the more common ones, lack of infrastructure or girls' schooling nearby, cost, um, hidden, including hidden fees, conflict or crisis, and gendered biases that discount the value of education for girls. Um, the second piece and the second challenge is ensuring that once girls are in school, the right physical and social environment is in place to support them to both learn effectively and to stay in school. Um, if we have learned anything from the Ebola crisis or the COVID pandemic, it's that girls can be particularly vulnerable in the face of prolonged school closures. 
and that they tend to have less resources behind them to support continuity of learning. And as we face the likelihood of possible future closures as a result of, for example, more frequent climate disasters, it's really important to get this right. Um, it requires a sustained, system-wide effort to ensure that all aspects of education promote gender equality, so curriculum content and materials, environment, teacher practice, school management, etc. Um, to the second half of your question, segueing, um, about Malala Khan's work, of course, all of that is much easier said than done, because much of it requires money and, and political will and leadership as well. Um, Malala Khan's role is really to advocate and to fund advocacy work around education financing, so increasing the funding that's available to girls' education, both in national budgets and globally. Um, around social norms, so countering the patriarchal social norms that limit girls' opportunities and ambitions. And thirdly, around education quality, so increasing the quality and relevance of education that girls can benefit from to make sure that they can develop the skills they need to engage meaningfully with the world around them. Um, there's a few ways that we do this, and we try to work at different levels. Um, the first, and arguably I would say the most important, we fund local educators and activists in nine countries around the world where the most girls miss out on secondary education. They are the leaders. They're creating incredible change in their communities and countries. Um, as I've said, we know many of the barriers to access for girls' education are highly context-specific, and no one knows these better than, than the people really working in those communities. Um, that's really Malala Khan's starting point. Our founders, Malala and Ziadin, are activists at heart, remain so to this day, and. Um, we, we believe that these activists have the innovation, energy, and insights to counteract the challenges and barriers that keep girls from school in different communities. So we fund them, we fund their organizations. Um, that funding has enabled things like training female teachers in Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, in increasing girls' enrollment in northern Nigeria through dialogue with community leaders and parents. Um, there's countless other examples. We also bring together partners in each country to work on joint and collective advocacy, often at subnational and national level. And this has included work that seeks to expand education budgets or expand the right to education itself to encompass the full cycle of secondary. Um, so much change is needed and is important at the local and national level, but there is still a major role for the international community to play in the achievement of SDG 4 and SDG 5. Um, and as Malala Khan, we work across different, um, what you traditionally call donor governments, high income country governments, to ensure that donors are collectively stepping up to cut the external education funding gap by fulfilling commitments to spend 0.7% of GNI on aid and prioritise within that um, support to education in the poorest countries. Um, we also overall advocate for. Um, education to be a core part and policy, uh, a core part and priority within foreign development policies, which is really where the REDAC comes in. Um, that is what it signals from the US government and that is what it, it enables. Um, thank you for the question. Thank you so much. You also said a lot, and I just want to underline just a few things that I think are really important and just worth hearing again. I love that you talked about um, the importance of data and speaking to the data that you do have. The data is never going to be perfect, but um, with the data showing that when girls have access and opportunity, they are learning. And those results are really um, crystal clear. And just the importance of the cultural context and um, being able to appreciate the nuances in each culture. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, turn to Ms. Shuey. You've been in the classroom, and um, we would just love to hear your experiences as a teacher. Um, we've been talking about the importance of starting early, early education and, and exposure to literacy, and then the specific um, issues as it pertains to girls. Can you just talk a little bit about what you've observed in the classroom? Um, thank you everyone for this opportunity. I feel truly honored to be in a room full of wonderful people and I would be happy to share my experiences. So for me, education has been a deeply personal and transformative journey. 
belonging to a village in Pakistan without any access to school for girls, I understood firsthand the power of education to change lives. Um, I feel privileged and lucky to have been able to access education elsewhere, which ultimately led me to the Fulbright Scholarship, which was made possible by the funding and education by the USD Department and partners. And so I firmly believe that every child, regardless of their background, deserves this fundamental human right to quality and inclusive education, and it can be a driver of positive change. And so for context, I started my teaching journey in, uh, in, during the COVID pandemic in a low-income community school in Islamabad, Pakistan, and the situation was particularly challenging. Um, school closures led to a profound impact on student learning outcomes, which led to students dropping out of school. Um, boys often faced, the, they were forced into engage in child labor practices, and girls faced the prospect of early marriages. So it was a stark reminder of how education can be a lifeline for all these children and provide them an opportunity to um, access a brighter future. Um, so in context of all of this, keeping this in mind, I worked to ensure that the learning continued during the pandemic and I designed a distance learning plan to help build literacy and numeracy skills of my, with my students. Um, one of the primary objectives was to engage community members and all key relevant stakeholders in our education efforts. And so um, my aim was also to create awareness about the value of education in our community. Um, during this pandemic, it was a low-income community, so there was limited access to technology and resources. And so I surveyed my students to figure out who had access to these digital resources, and I designed a buddy system. In this system, I divided my students into different groups, ensuring that at least one of them had access to a cell phone so I could conduct online classes. And to further facilitate their learning, I also designed um, bilingual learning packs with content to help build their literacy and numeracy skills and provide clear instructions and practice questions. Our school had received some books from USAID and so I distributed those books along with the learning facts and these books really served as a lifeline for many of my students because they offered an opportunity for English language exposure for them. Um, and so this system, I continued this process uh, um, throughout the school closure period and I also collaborated with different teachers in our school to ensure that not only my students but all the children in our community had access to these learning opportunities during the pandemic. To assess their learning progress and the learning outcomes, I also conducted bi-weekly tests on WhatsApp in which their family members or their parents acted as exam proctors. Um, and so the results of all our efforts were truly heartening. About 80% of our students scored above average in math and science. And what was equally inspiring to see was that students started gaining confidence and they started writing stories, taking inspiration from the stories that they had read in books from USA. Um, their reading comprehension and literacy skills improved and their numeracy skills, including um, pattern recognition and basic math operations were also enhanced. Um, what was equally wonderful to see was the support that we got, got from the community, the parents and the community members, they were equally engaging in our learning initiatives. And so more importantly, there were no school dropouts. Um, students continued to stay in school eager to explore new opportunities. And so this literacy and numeracy program had a really positive impact on all the lives of the children in my community. Um, it offered them a chance to learn and explore new opportunities. Um, so, and parents were also, they deeply appreciated and valued education, they started valuing it, and so all, overall this provided a really supportive learning environment for the children itself. Um, this experience really demonstrated the truly transformative power of education, even for me, because it was a reminder that with the right approaches, even in the most marginalized communities, even in crisis situations, student learning outcomes can be improved. And as Malala said, and something that I firmly believe in, one book, one pen, one child, and a teacher can truly change the world. As we are all aware that children who belong to marginalized communities, or groups, and children with disabilities, they are still deprived of this privilege to the fundamental human right of quality inclusive education. I believe, and everyone here believes, that every child does deserve the opportunity to learn and recognize their true potential. And so with the right approaches and dedication, we can all truly make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for yet another incredible story about 
um, opportunity and access, and I think that's the, the theme that we're hearing across this panel. Um, thank you all for your incredible insights on global literacy and the barriers that get in the way of attainment and what you have been doing in your own personal advocacy as well as with your organizations to up overcome those barriers. Um, I'd like to now in involve you all, the audience, and see if there might be questions from the audience, and if so, to make your way to the microphone um, to raise your question and ask the panel. Are we feeling a little shy today? <laughs> Great, here's a question. Terrific. Happy to break the ice. Um, I, a lot of us are talking about outcomes, and I was curious if you all would speak a little bit more to the type of outcomes that would be useful to know. Um, I think a lot of times we're excited to talk about rates of improvement, but we don't often talk about meaningful outcomes. Uh, we'll talk about statistical significance, but we won't lean into how do we know that we're reaching a barrier where this is a useful education. Um, and I'm curious from any of your experience um, how you might speak to that. <coughs> would anyone on the panel like to take the question? I'll sort of double down and say yes. <laughs> uh, and um, you know, I think there's there's a couple of pieces of this. I think one is it's 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 hard and it's expensive to do deep work. I mean, we spend a lot on getting those that data, you know, um, but we think it's important to have that so that we know what's working and what's not. I think one of the things that we really haven't had is that kind of longitudinal data collection and research to see the long-term implications. We have you know, economic data, so we're trying to sort of hobble together, I think, a lot of different resources to, to look at that, but I think there's a lot of gaps and I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to look at research. I think the other piece, and Laurie mentioned this, is the fact that we don't necessarily have great assessment tools, and I would say especially in early childhood. So we're doing a lot of work right now at Assessment Workshop on not just looking at early childhood assessment, but how can we actually transform that? How can we use play-based assessment, right? Really thinking about how you engage children in ways that are intuitive to them to understand what learning outcomes look like, because it's not about teaching to a test, right? It's about seeing how that expands their imaginations and they bring that into everyday life. And play is for you know, young kids, of course, the way that they show that. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for us and things that hopefully we'd be able to address with continuation of the READ Act. Thank you. So I just got word that Representative Frankel has just arrived. So I'm going to ask you all to thank our panel um, for the uh, wonderful discussion. And then I'm going to transition right over to Kitty Close, the Director of Government Relations, to come on up and introduce Representative Frankel. So please thank me and join us. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce my former boss, Congresswoman Lois Frankel, who proudly serves Florida's 22nd District in the House of Representatives. Congresswoman Frankel currently sits on the House Appropriations Committee, where she is a member of the Labor, Health, and Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies Subcommittee, as well as the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee. Congresswoman Frankel is chair of the Democratic Women's Caucus, and co-chair of the Bipartisan Women, Peace, and Security Caucus on Capitol Hill, and she has spent her congressional career fighting for women and girls' rights, particularly for their access to quality education here in the United States and around the world. Prior to her election to the House of Representatives, Congresswoman Frankel served in the Florida State Legislature and as mayor of West Palm Beach, where she earned her reputation as an innovative problem solver. We're so pleased to have you here this morning, Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. She did great work in my office. And I'm glad that you're carrying on the fight for education. And I missed Ed Royce, didn't I? Well, we had so many great travels together. He was really a wonderful chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here and for fighting uh, for the cause, right? Uh, I have a lot, my staff helped me write some remarks, but it, this is really this part of my mission here is to really better the children of the world, just like uh, trying to help the children here in America. And you know, I think when I was I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee for many many years, Ed was the chair, 
and uh, I got to travel all over the world. I went to lots of schools, and, um, but this one story really stood out. I was at a little village in Malawi. I mean, it was in the middle of nowhere. I remember they were with such great pride, they took me to see a school for the little children. And the kids were just so proud to be in school. And then I saw a teenage girl. She was not in school, excuse me. And I said, what, you know, how come you're not in school? She said, the school, the secondary school is miles away. And it is not safe for me to walk there. And you know, that's one of maybe a hundred and what, 30 million stories for the young girls around the world who are out of school for so many different reasons, whether it's cultural or the conflicts uh, or the safety like this young lady. Uh, but here's what we do know why you're all here is that for both boys and girls, when they are educated, they have the opportunity for a better life, right? whether it's their health, their economic success, uh, peace in their communities, in their countries. And that's really what we are all fighting for. And many of us in Congress, and probably you too, whenever you hear about a conflict in the world, don't you get worried about what is happening to children? But how many of you are parents or grandparents? Just think about it. You want your children in school because when children are not in school, bad things can happen, right? Especially if it's for long periods of time. And for boys, I remember when we, when the conflict in Syria, and now we have kids out of school in Ukraine, we can keep going around the world. There is a higher risk, you probably know this, for boys who are out of school, for extremism, for violence and for girls to have early marriages, child, child marriages. So uh, that's why it's so important that we're working together to get this READ Act passed. You know more about it than me probably. We've been fighting. We did pass it in the House last year because it does so much good. For example, training. One year we trained something like 300,000 teachers, uh, all 300,000 teachers all over the world. So you're here, you're going to march around the Senate, I guess. Is that what you're here to do? <laughs> uh, shake up some of these people. Um, sometimes this place feels dysfunctional, like every day. <laughs> but this is, a this is a bipartisan cause. And if people can't understand why children have to be in school, then I'm not sure they're breathing, right? Everybody needs to understand that. So knock on those doors, shake up the senators. I think the Senate did not pass the bill uh, last year, is that correct? On appropriations, uh, we have put in, I think this year, something like uh, $910 million, something like that, in our, uh, what's called our s Fox bill, which really, I'll tell you what, in the House, which is another nightmare in itself, <laughs> as we forge on to a shutdown. Uh, very interesting because the Republicans cut back on every single, just about every single budget, but left this issue even. So sometimes good things happen, right? So that, 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 was, that was good news. We're gonna be pushing for more money. I think the Senate's come in a little bit lower, so pound those men and women here. Anyway, listen, I just, I wanna thank, I gotta see if my staff wants me, was there something I missed? <laughs> I feel bad because they, they bore over this. Anyway, listen folks, thank you, thank you, thank you, Kitty, for your organization. Everybody who's doing this and uh, our, all our children of this world deserve an opportunity to be the best that they can. It's going to be very tough for them to do it without a good education. And it's going to mean something for all of us because children who are educated and grow up healthier and more successful and have peaceful communities and it's a more peaceful world. So thank you very much for all you're doing.
thank you so much. Um, don't get hurt. <laughs> I, think the, I think the most important thing you told us today is that we have the ability to shake things up. So I think we um, feel empowered to do so. Um, we are getting close to the end of our program. Um, I just want to thank our really wonderful speakers again. I want to close by um, uh, going straight to our closing video. Um, our, we have a closing video from Francine Niamahuza, um, and she is a 21-year-old Global Partnership for Education youth leader, originally from Rwanda, who lives in a refugee camp in Malawi. She's worked as a community social worker for Jesuit Refugee Services on the Nuwaza project. Growing up as a refugee, she knows that the only way of succeeding is by getting educated. She believes that education allows refugees and young people to attain knowledge and skills that can be used in different aspects of their lives. So if we can just go straight to the video. Hello, you are sword leaders. My name is Francine Jungheuser, a GPE youth leader originally from Rwanda, but I live in Malawi as a refugee. Uh, I remember the time that I came here in Malawi. I was only a one-year-old child, and I was able to access every education. Uh, that boosted my capability to have foundation learning skills, numerical skills, and some reading skills. All these skills that I got from my early education, they helped me thrive through my primary school because of the facilities that were available in the camp that I and my family lived in. Uh, from there, it was hard to get into secondary school because I had no files and my parents weren't allowed to work in the camp that we are in for them to be able to find me. Um, unlike my peers, some of them were not able to access education because of their disabilities and one of my friends, Angel, was excluded from education facilities because our schools had no any sign language teachers and tutors to accommodate her. So she was excluded from education because of that. Okay, as a student in my secondary school, there were some challenges that I faced as a girl. Um, I wasn't able to access some services that were vital for me as a girl. For example, menstrual hygiene and I had a fear for my fellow classmates who were being married off to fend their families because they were expected to marry rich men before they attained the age of 18. There are also some natural disasters that affect education systems like the recent floods that happened in the southern region of Malawi. Um, some school blocks collapsed and electri electricity facilities were disturbed. This caused students to be out of school for a long period of time in order to allow to allow institutions to be able to rebuild their blocks and different facilities. On the same point when the floods happened in the camp was flooded, was overcrowded by a lot of people. And to help in those situations I joined a community that was cleaning up because of improper waste management here. Yeah, I like other students or other peers that I lived with. My life had a different channel because uh, I was funded by the Jesuits Refugee Services to get into tertiary education. And one symbol that caught my attention was the U.S. log that made me realize that the USAID log helps organizations like GRS in funding different girls and allowing them to, to have access to education. Um, I am also aware of a uh, global campaign in education US and global partners for education that they work with governments and partners to make sure that vulnerable girls have access to education. Okay, my message to the US sword leaders is to to see them build up a system that will encourage and accommodate all girls into education. And I want to see policies being initiated to promote education for girls. I would also love to see education systems that will accommodate 
children with disabilities because in most cases these are victims for they they are always being excluded when it comes to education i would also love to see strategies being put up at all levels to ensure that every child marriage is eliminated or avoided at all cost um i would also love to see technology advancement that would accommodate lessons in the midst of chaos, for example, natural dis disasters and any other emergencies and crises. Uh, it would also be exciting to see teachers, healthcare and host communities being trained on how to handle children in emergencies like conflicts and natural crises. Lastly, I am counting on you to make uh, funding education a priority because I believe that the world needs educated child and this yields so many returns to different societies. Thank you. powerful, powerful testimony um, from Francine, and we know that she is one voice, but that she represents millions of girls, millions of children around the world. So I, I really hope that um, her message and her story resonated with you. Um, we've come to a close with our program, but I really want to um, just draw us in on what is the call to action. And I think Representative Franklin said it best, shake it up. Do what you can within your power um, to help get the READ um, Act passed urgently. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention on global literacy. Thank you for um, thinking about not just yourselves, but children and families around the world. Um, just a couple of reminders. There is food in the back. <laughs> so um, we encourage you to eat it <laughs> or it will be thrown out. Um, and we do have the room for a few minutes. And so we think networking is a really important part of this process. So um, please talk amongst each other and um, form some new um, relationships. And I just want to thank you all for your attention today. And really want to thank all of our speakers today for all of your incredible, incredible insights. So thank you. Go and be great. Enjoy the food. And um, thank you for your work on getting the READ Act reauthorization passed.